I'm going to talk about uh, five to the four using perturbation theory. So this is a bit uh, slightly away from the main uh, topic uh, of this, uh, uh, well, the main approach taken of strongly coupled uh, systems in this uh, workshop. So um, I will try to be as pedagogical as possible. So the, uh, the plan of my talk is the following. I will uh, start with a, a very brief review on uh, perturbation theory at large orders and uh, how you borrow a sum, at under what condition you can do that and so on. I mean, as what we know, this is not clearly a very well known uh, subject. And then uh, I will uh, show how you can take a geometric picture to this problem, which is, uh, so if you wish, uh, this is a bit of a history. I will let you, I, I will tell you just uh, the basic facts known uh, since uh, since decades, I would say. <laughs> then uh, this geometric picture uh, is something which uh, I think it came out more recently. And then uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, concept of exact perturbation theory very recently. And then uh, based on this uh, geometric approach, which we will never really need uh, unless uh, to have the grand picture, we'll just show how to do computations uh, using you know, computing loops in phi to the four and then resumming and, uh, and uh, and I will show you how this, uh, our approach is different from previous historical approaches to the same problem. So approaching phi to the four in, in uh, using perturbation theory is clearly not new. There is at least the epsilon expansion, which, uh, which uh, you know, since decades. And also there is another uh, approach at fixed dimension. So these are the historical approach. We will take another slightly different approach. And then uh, finally, I will show you with my laptop with so the some result. So since this is work in progress, let me just make the disclaimer that uh, some, of the, uh, <coughs> some of the plots I will show to you will not be the final one, but hopefully the grand, the grand picture should be, should be correct. <laughs> so this is based on work in progress, as I said, hopefully will appear at some point and with uh, Gabriele Spada, PhD student at CISA, and uh, Giovanni <coughs> Villaloro, which is uh, staff at I ICTP. Okay? And also I will talk a bit about uh, some previous works in the, uh, in, the, in the context of quantum mechanics. So let me just uh, 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 briefly review. So as you, you might know, most of perturbative expansion in uh, both in quantum mechanics and in quantum field theory are actually F0 radius of convergence. So I remind you that, uh, well, <laughs> trivial analysis, that whenever you have uh, uh, an expansion which has zero radius of convergence, means that as an analytic function on your uh, coupling constant, or if you wish h bar, if you want to look at a, a loopwise expansion, as, a, as a, an analytic function of that, of that coupling, the point in which you are expanding is non-analytic. Because if it would be analytic, there will be a little disk in which uh, you will have uh, the power series convergence with some uh, radius, say, whatever. If this radius is exactly zero, means that you are expanding around a non-analytic point. So this can be very easily seen uh, by a say, sort of uh, modern uh, argument of Dyson historical, uh, uh, very nice argument. So the modern uh, Dyson argument is very general and very nice and very simple. So take an arbitrary theory, so correlation function connected or 1pi, whatever, connected correlation function in, say, in configuration of moment to space, doesn't matter. And uh, here I want to emphasize the, the, the dependence on h bar. So this is going to be in an Euclidean version. This is a path integral on your field, e to the minus the action over h bar, and then uh, with the insertion of your, uh, of your fields, phi 1, x1, phi n, xn, right? So this is the standard textbook things that we know. So here, what we notice here, so loopwise expansion means that you, you, you study this uh, in a semi-classical limit in which h bar is supposed to be very small. Actually, you expand around h bar equal to zero. So the leading, uh, the leading configuration is the classical one, then the loop correction, you have the one loop and the higher loop. But then you see here that the point h bar equal to zero is singular. You immediately see that. Because in the limit, if I take h bar 0 minus, right, this exponent becomes positive and everything blows up. So this correlation function at 0 minus is simply infinite. 
Okay? So I'm assuming here that S is positive definite, so this is a good exponential suppression, so configuration are well defined, but if they are well defined for 0 plus, they are clearly ill defined for 0 minus. So you don't need to do big uh, thinking to see that h bar equal to 0 as an exact function of this cannot be analytic at 0. And then uh, you see that uh, uh, if we consider coupling constant expansion which can be related to loopwise expansion, which are what we are going to do today, and it's particularly true for simple theories like phi to the 4, this will also hold true for the coupling constant expansion. So the point uh, coupling <coughs> g equal to 0, say in the phi to the 4, is going to be non a non-analytic uh, point. Okay? That, so this implies that if you expand uh, in perturbation theory, you will get an asymptotic series. As you know, you will not get a convergent series. And then uh, the point is what we can do then with perturbation theory, right? So with perturbation theory, you can do two things still. So let me be brief because I guess you know these things. So uh, one thing that you know, so if I have a, a variable, say, <coughs> z of g, I, I write z because I have in mind some sort of a partition function, but this can be any correlation function and g is the coupling constant, h bar or the coupling related to h bar. So uh, when you do, you do perturbation theory, you write uh, this as a, an infinite series, well, infinite, as, as some point you to truncate, but in principle it's an infinite series of this form. I don't put the equality because I just said that this doesn't make any sense, this object in it mathematically, so this cannot be equal to this object that is, that is your physical observable. So we write this sort of... Uh, of, of uh, symbol just to denote that uh, this is uh, the asymptotic expansion of that, of that variable. So since this doesn't make any sense mathematically, you may wonder wh why we do perturbation theory, but then it turns out that uh, if the theory is asymptotic, for small values of, it, of the coupling, you still can get a meaningful result. So in particular, if this Zn grows at large n as some factorial power and then with the coefficient a to the n, which is typically what happens both in quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, this is the behavior for pa parametrically large n of the coefficient of the expansion. So it, well, if this is the case, then uh, uh, you can simply see that here you can do what is called optimal truncation. So you look at when, uh, at some point, the Zn is so big that no matter when g, how, how big is, is g is small, you will start to get uh, worse and worse results. So if you do this with a little, with a trivial Stirling formula, you find that the n best, n best is the value which you, you should truncate here this sum. This is of the order of one over the modulus of this a times g. So at, at given g, at given a theory, there is a, the best number of loops, so to say, after which you shouldn't go on, because if you go on, it's becoming worse and worse. Clearly, it depends on the coupling. So you see when uh, the coupling is very small, ordinary perturbation theory, and best is very large, which means that you can reliably use perturbation theory to many, many orders. <laughs> so in QAD, we will, we will never worry about, uh, you know, to this the, the asymptotic nature of, of, the, of, the, um, of the theory. We had to worry about other things, but okay. Uh, couldn't, in principle, this whole thing break down even <coughs> cautiously before you reach n best? <coughs> given that the function, given that you don't know what this function does, couldn't you cook up a function z of g, which starts disagreeing uh, even for smaller, you know? Everything is possible because uh, you know this is not this is no longer ma a mathematical precise. Uh, well, I will argue now in a second that uh, this is unlikely because this behavior will tell you how the Borel resummed uh, form applies. But uh, I, I tell you this is not a rigorous argument. So what you say can hap can happen, although it is has not ever been seen as far as I know. So well, I mean, of course, if you have more and more particles, you have other uh, other combinatorial factors and things get even worse. Right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, the, 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 uh, the, fu the situation in a realistic theory is much more complicated, but uh, the, the, parameter, the, the, the general picture is uh, typically... Uh, yeah, okay, I mean, you, you see, in, in, in four-dimensional theories, there are ma many other problems. So whatever I'm saying applies uh, to, to few systems, in particular to the five to the four. That's why I'm telling you, but if you go to, say, QCD or QAD, we have uh, other problems that I will briefly mention here. So th th there is a, a limited, uh, uh, at the moment, applicability of all these uh, uh, ideas to large orders. 
so renormal malum and so on. So there are big uh, issues here that, uh, uh, so I'm, 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 I have in mind, you know, simple quantum field theory, simple system, low dimensions. Otherwise, we have other problems. So anyhow, uh, this is what you can do. And then once you do that, you see that there is an intrinsic error, which is, which is simply what is the, the, the tail of your truncated, uh, your truncated sum that you can also estimate. And then you will see that this goes like e to the minus 1 over a times g. So you see that there is an ambiguity. You, you will never be able to get a result as more accurate than this by the simple fact that, uh, as you know, asymptotic series are not uniquely defined. If I have uh, one asymptotic, they, they, will, they do not uniquely define a function. If I have an asymptotic series, there are an infinite number of functions that have the same asymptotic series. So this sort of ambiguity is related to this fact that you will never be able to have accurate description. OK, simply because of the asymptotic nature of the, of the, of the um, expansion. So the, uh, oh, the other things you can do is uh, uh, try to resum the, the, the function. As you know, we, this is also a possibility. So infinite sums, uh, divergent sums can be given a, a meaning with an analytic continuation and other means. So the best, uh, mo the most powerful uh, method to the sum a, a, a series is the Borel one. So what you do essentially is uh, uh, the following. You define another function. So given that, I, I trivially define another function by simply dividing by the factorial, my original coefficient. OK, so it's a pretty of a silly thing. And then I can redefine a function, which I call it ZB of G, which is simply the Laplace transform of this BZ. So if you do that, it's a trivial exercise to say, uh, you can see by naked eye that if I do this and you expand this function back, you recover precisely the asymptotic series that you found. But if somehow you are able to find this function in a closest form, this is going to give you a well-defined function, which I call ZB of G. Sorry, this is uh, GT, otherwise there is no G dependence, right? So, uh, now, this is, uh, uh, okay, uh, now, this bz of t as an analytic function in t, you see that in order to this to have sense, it has to be analytic on t plus, because we are, we are integrating over this uh, positive semi-real axis. If it is not analytic on t plus, we say that this series is not border summable. So the notion of not, not border summability means that uh, the analytic property of this function do not allow to do this. And uh, okay, uh, in general, even if uh, this function exists, namely B Z is border summable, there is there are no <coughs> um, singularities on T plus. In general, this is not guaranteed to be equal to the original one. I give you a very simple instance of this, which is in, super in quantum mechanics. If you consider the supersymmetric double well, so this is an example of this uh, simple fact, probably one of the simplest examples you can imagine, physically interesting. In quantum mechanics, if you consider the SUSI double well, so you might know that uh, this is a famous model. Uh, it undergoes uh, uh, spontaneous uh, symmetry breaking, dynamical spontaneous symmetry breaking, which means that uh, the ground state energy is zero as a function of the coupling is zero to all orders in perturbation theory. But then uh, it actually non-zero, non-perturbatively, because of instantons. So this has been studied by Witten in, in, uh, in his famous paper on dynamical supersymmetry breaking. So in particular, E0 of G goes like uh, E to the e to the minus a constant over g, plus other terms. I mean, it's a non-perturbative effect. So you see here that if I blindly consider uh, borders, 0 is a border summable. So this is a series in which I have all zeros, which means that bz is 0, and then a zb is 0. And then I will conclude that e0 of, e of g is 0. And uh, clearly, this is not true, because e0 is not 0. So you see? 
I have a border trivial border summable function which does not reproduce the full result. So there are some analytic conditions that should be fulfilled. So whenever you have, uh, you should know analytic properties of, the, of your observables. Under some assumption, then uh, this is becomes an identity. So you need to know some extra information in order to establish that this is true. And when this is true, we said that, that the function is your, your uh, ZB is, uh, your observable Z is a border resummable to the exact result. So you have to add this uh, to the exact result, meaning that not only you, you can borrow some your series, but actually you are not missing any non-perturbative effect. So this is what we are interested in, not really to borrow some ability in itself, but when we are ensured that borrow some ability gives the full result. We know that are missing uh, non-perturbative pieces around, because if this is the case, what's the point to go to strong coupling? Okay? So uh, the... So you might ask, uh, okay, but this is not easy because we have to know the analytic properties, uh, the exact analytic properties of your system, and this is typically complicated, uh, a complicated question. I mean, we don't have an easy answer to that. <coughs> Luckily, this has been done uh, for some simple system in the past, so we do know a bit on simple system the analytic properties of this Z. And then uh, there are some results about whether or not you can be a uh, border summable to the exact result. Now, um, let me just, to, to give you some intuition, uh, um, tell you a bit, a bit more on this uh, BZ of T. Because we, we are assuming here that this is analytic on T plus, but let me just a few short, shortly give you some intuition on the which condition this can be analytic on T plus, okay, BZ. So the simplest things to, to do is just to look at it, uh, uh, to consider a theory uh, that has, uh, uh, no, this asymptotic behavior, as I told you, this is a very general situation. Then you see that if I apply to this specific case, I, if I compute bz of t, okay, this is roughly given by sum over n of a to the n, a t to the n at large n, no? because you, the n factorial is removed by hand. And then uh, this is simply power series, it goes like 1 over 1 minus a t. So very simple. So you see that there are two situations depending on the sign of a. So if a is positive, namely means that you have a series with all the same sign uh, series. If a is positive, you have a singularity here <coughs> that is at uh, 1 over a on the t plus. So a positive, same sign, same sign series, it's an indication of not borrowed summability. Straight away. I mean, you don't even, you, you should stop at, at, at the beginning, okay? So if A is negative, in more complicated situation, A can be complex, but okay, I don't want to enter into that. So if A is negative, oscillati osc oscillatory um, series, things are much better. In particular, you have here that uh, the singularities is uh, on the positive, on the negative real axis. So this is in principle border summable. Why do I say in principle? I say in principle because in general this is only the large order behavior of your function and then you, what you are able to do with using the large order behavior is having the access only at the closest singularities. So if we ha I have a, a t-plane here and then you have your Borel function, so I'm able to explore only the asymptotic region close to t equal to zero. Because the next to leading correction here, that of course in, in realistic theories will be there, one over n correction, will give you possibly other possible singularities in this plane. So this is not enough. So sometimes in the literature, people now claims that uh, uh, knowing this, you can claim a borrowed summability, but that's not true. This is only tell you that the leading singularity is, is on the correct side, so it's not on T plus, but then who knows about others, okay? <coughs> So in principle, this is Borel, but still you have to consider the rest uh, possible, the emergence <coughs> of other singularities in this plane. Of course, the, the farther distance is the singularity and the milder is the singularity, the milder it is because of with this exponential suppression, at some practical level, if the singularity appears very, very far away, you might not even care with some precision. Okay? The closer you are, the more important is the source of singularities. So generically then, uh, uh, what can happen, just let me give you one minute uh, introduction just for pedagogical purposes on this other approach that I'm not taking. 
So typically, what can happen is that you can either have A greater than zero, so a direct singularity is uh, already at the leading level, or some other singularities that you can uh, find uh, by doing a better uh, analysis here. If you have a singularity at some point on this, uh, on the positive axis, still you shouldn't really give up. You, sh you, sh you can still uh, keep going. And the way in which you can, uh, you can keep going is the following. So if this is T0, the source, the, the, the point of, of singularities, you can deform your contour, let's say I plus, passing uh, up or down of the singularities. So I up or I, 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 I plus, sorry, and I minus. So this is what is called a lateral Borel summation. You avoid the singularities by trivially deforming your contour. So that's fine, but clearly it's obvious that uh, there will be an ambiguity because this difference is non-zero, and uh, for this particular case, it's simply the residue of the pole of this singularity, right? The residue of the pole is uh, something <coughs> which has to do with the C to the minus 1 over G that I wrote. It's a non-perturbative effect. So then what can you hope? A hope that you can have is that, okay, you do this, and then you have uh, some ideas, because the sum is, is well-defined, the difference is not. And then you hope that uh, maybe if this singularity has to do with some non-perturbative correction, then uh, I should add to my series another series, which is now the series around this non-perturbative correction. This will give me rise, to, it's another saddle point if you wish, with its, it, with, it, with its own uh, perturbative series. And hopefully there will be another ambiguity there that will cancel this one. And then uh, by playing, then there will be yet maybe another ambiguity at sub-leading level on this Easton, uh, let's say Easton sector that might require to add another one. And then you keep going with an infinite chain. And if this succeeds, you actually have reproduced a uh, non-ambiguous result for your, for your observable. So this is, goes under the name of resurgence. And, uh, and it's a possibility to reconstruct using this uh, say perturbation theory around multi saddles your final exact result. So here I'm not taking this approach. Uh, but that by itself only guarantees that you found some prescription order by order that Borel is summable. You still do not know that that... Yeah, yeah, there are many, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there, there are many, many issues that I, I, I'm not, uh, yeah. I, I mean, you see, I, I'm uh, in a few minutes, I, I get rid of an entire, uh, so there are m m many aspects <laughs> that, 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 that I cannot, uh, well, m m many which I simply do not know, I'm not an expert enough, and some I don't have time to, to review. This is, still we are a bit far away from our, so just to tell you that there is this other approach, okay. So, the, um, the, the best, uh, the, the ideal approach instead is when uh, you have uh, simply something which is border summable to begin with, no instant on contribution, just one series will give you the full result. So this is the goal. This is the dream, right? So the, um, um, in 75, Ekman, Mannion, and Senior, are mathematical physicists, have proved mathematically, axiomatically, that the 5 to the 4 theory, well, first of all, by, by building on some other work by Gleam and Jaffe and others, and Spencer, they have proved that this theory makes sense. Namely, exists at the non-perturbative level, which is usually, we take it for granted, but it's not obvious. So there is a well-defined continuum limit. There is a well continuum limit in the UV. There is a well-defined infrared limit, a large infinite volume. So this theory seems to make sense at infinite volume and a no cutoff. Not only the phi to the four, but also in two dimensions, but also in three dimensions. While they were not able to prove uh, the existence of the phi to the four, and in fact, uh, no, we believe that this theory doesn't exist if not for the free theory. So. Um, so the, the, these gentlemen not only have proved that this theory uh, makes sense, but they are actually proved that all correlation functions are Borel summable to the exact result. So they've proven Borel summability. Borel summability, again, I always use in the sense of uh, to the exact result, not on this technical sense of no, not, not analyticity. So they've proven that there are no instant on contribution. If you are able to do perturbation theory, you will find uh, all the result. However, they, they, they prove uh, as uh, some assumptions. So the first assumption is that uh, this is in the broken phase. 
and then they, they were able to prove, you know, axiomatically they were very powerful, but then you have a lot of condition. So they have been able to prove this for, a, for an infinitesimal disk close to, the, uh, close to zero. <laughs> so for uh, the values of g, which is, uh, say, less than some epsilon, and, uh, and, and clearly the real part of g has to be greater than the zero. So uh, g is the coupling of the 5 to the 4. So uh, g equal to zero just said that it's always an analytic point. So they say that there is an analyticity here. In this regime here, which is an infinitesimal disk um, around epsilon, around, sorry, around zero the, the on the positive real sides, the, the, um, the, all the green function are borrowed or something. So I, I, I'm confused here. So first of all, as far as I know, it's proven that this theory exists for any G. So, so the theory exists both No, there are two things. The, the theory exists for any G. Yeah. Borrowed some abilities has been established in this regime. But what, what does it mean? So this function, this function BZ, it should exist and be analytic, right? Even if you want to have Borel's mobility at any g, no, no matter how small, we first of all have to establish the existence of this function pz. Yeah. Which they must have done. Yes, but you, they, they, the they don't, they, they bypass the problem of b of z, because uh, there are conditions for which, uh, you know, if I tell you what is, uh, what is, uh, uh, what are the analytic properties of my z, not b of z, Okay, there are some analytic con condition, and uh, then you can uh, prove uh, indirectly the existence of a Borel uh, representation in terms of an asymptotic series. I haven't seen. No, that. But what is the problem? The problem is the, in the existence <coughs> of the integral, or in, the f in proving that that integral agrees with the, with the no. exact result, which they prove by other means. No, no, they prove. As I told you, they, they do. They go. They go, go through this uh, explicitly to this integral. They don't need to do that. So they prove that the, uh, th there are mathematical uh, theorems that tells you that uh, whenever a function has uh, this asymptotic uh, form uh, series with some coefficient in, in, a, in a domain, <coughs> provided that there are some analyticity properties of this function, okay, which is, uh, well, I can tell you it's... Marco, perhaps I did not formulate the question correctly. Before, you told us that what it means for function to be Borel summable. Now you are telling us a different uh, phenomenon. For function to be very solvable somewhere, but not everywhere. This you did not explain. What does it mean for function to be very solvable somewhere, but not everywhere? No, I'm telling you what they proved. I will, uh, I will show you, in fact, that yeah. this, uh, this uh, regime will extend up to, at least up to the G critical. But I don't understand how, you know, given what you explained before, how, how does what they no, but prove, agree with what you explained before? Before you said either the function is Borel's sum. No, 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 uh, sorry. I mean, this was, no, but it did, uh, I'm sorry. I was, no, too, I I was too quick. I was too quick. This is, a, it's, it's understood here that there is a domain, which is the domain of analyticity of your original function, where this makes sense. It's not everywhere. So you start with a theory that has this, this representation in some domain. So everything I said is always in the domain. It's not for any g. It's not the whole complex plane. This will be too much. There is always a domain behind in which I can, I, I'm able to establish this. So this domain, perturbation theory, is typically a little this close to the origin because I'm simply exploring the function there. Nobody is able to know whether this function here, this asymptotic series, makes sense for large values of the coupling. So that's why it's always, whatever I said, applies locally in a domain. But I, I'm still, I, I repeat my question, sorry Marco, I don't understand, if I don't understand, means that probably other people don't understand. <laughs> so consider that integral, you say they did not consider that integral, but now you explain this in terms of this integral, so you have to show how what you are telling now agrees with your previous... Yes, I'm simply telling you that... Does that integral exist? For any g or only... It's not for any g, it is not for any g, this exists for the values of g, let's say uh, d, g, whatever, in a domain in which uh, this, I, I told you that the, this, is not, this is not true, this is only true whenever this function satisfies some analyticity properties. These analyticity, analyticity properties have been established by these people in a domain. So I, I can tell you, Bore, they can show us to, that the Borel summability and if you wish the existence of this function is in a domain. Okay, this is... Uh, Which function? Dz? Bz is, is a function which has to be defined on... But they never... 
you, you don't need to construct this function. Well, you, you don't need, but you went through that. So if because you, I, will, I will go through that, but now we are, you are asking me the question too early. So this so. function PZ, does it exist for, for this theory? Now you can, it's a concrete question. In order to construct Borel's probability, even for one value of g, take your favorite value of g, even for that one value of g, first of all, I have to construct this function PZ. Yes. yes. Okay, does this function exist or it doesn't exist? Yeah, yes, it, it does exist. It exists. It does exist, yes. So, so I will show you... I should take that function and evaluate that integral for any g. You know, given that the function... Because this function does not... You, you, I, mean, I will not be able to prove that this function exists for any g. I will be able but to... But it's a function, it, this function that you, that you show, it's, it's... First of all, I construct the function bz. If the function bz exists, I just substitute the argument by t by tg, and here, here it goes. I can consider this integral. You, yeah, so you can do that. that exists, you can do that, but then you do not know what are you computing. You can certainly do that. Okay. But then uh, wh whether this has to do with your original function is, uh, is, is to me, is unclear. In okay. fact, this is what I'm going to tell okay. you. Okay. What you are saying, you can always do, but then uh, the, the relation with the original uh, uh, z is unclear. Okay. 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 So this is what the, the, it has been proven, and uh, uh, yeah, and this is certainly it's an important result. So by the way, this has been proved also by um, the same authors in another paper for phi three to the four. Sorry, just to clarify, yes. epsilon is a concrete number, or epsilon no, epsilon is a, is a, is small. Yes, o of course. Let me tell you that unless you do not expect any pathologies, this can be also order one, but. So I, but the statement is that there exists an epsilon yeah, such that. A, yes, yes, exactly. This is the, the, the mathematical statement. I, I, I must say that I haven't followed the full, uh, uh, the, the full proof in detail because it's, uh, it's a bit involved. But yes, that's the, 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 the final outcome of the result. Now I think I, I'm, I'm doing very badly with time. There's so, there's yes, I'm oh, sorry, yes. If, if I wanted to look at higher polynomials, like five to <coughs> six, does this tell me anything about phi to the six, or is that like an entire new? Okay, good. So, uh, in, uh, in in three dimensions, I think it's completely unknown what what goes on, and I believe uh, th there is little hope that you have borrowed some ability. Also, because the theory, you know, uh, doesn't really exist, if you wish, uh, being start with phi to the six, yes, but uh, yeah, with other with other phi not. But here, in two dimensions, I believe they've been established that uh, uh, for polynomial, uh, for a generic polynomial, that you can have a borrowed sum ability. Okay, so sorry, maybe I'm uh, slowing down too much. Uh, um, le le let me now come to. So this is the end of the of the brief overview. Now let me go on on the <laughs> to the geometric picture. Hopefully, it will be quicker. So geometric picture is the following. So we. What is perturbation theory? <laughs> perturbation theory is essentially nothing else than uh, a, a, a way of doing a, a saddle point approximation from a quantum field theory point of view. Right? So that's what you do. You take the classical configuration and you expand. This is what we call perturbation theory. So then you, you sh we should ask, we should understand. So in general, given a system, there are many saddles. So I should consider all of them. So and what does it mean that the theory is uh, like the phi to the four? is borrow resumable to the exact result with a single series. So when does it happen? So why? I mean, uh, what is the relation between a perturbative contribution and the uh, perturbative contribution? So this is clearly a fundamental outstanding question in which we don't have in general an answer in, uh, in uh, <coughs> realistic, uh, say, gauge theories in four dimensions or things like that. But we can have a partial answer to simpler systems, in particular up to, the uh, up to two dimensional systems. So yeah, I don't have time to properly discuss this question. This was what we have uh, been doing in our previous papers for the simplest cases of uh, quantum mechanics and actually ordinary integrals. But I can give you just a bit of a feeling of what is the key point that will apply also for the phi to the four. So the key point here can be understood by looking at ordinary integrals. So the, the final answer will be essentially the following, that you should see a system that have uh, actually only one 
real solution to the question of motion. So at the end of the day, everything boils down to this uh, recipe. You look at the system, if there is only one uh, solution of motion, which is typically the trivial one, then you are ensured that uh, borrelsen mobility will be guaranteed. If there are more than one uh, non-trivial solution, then uh, uh, you have to consider other sectors, like uh, uh, the instanton sectors. Okay? When I mean uh, one solution, at finite with finite action. So with ordinary integrals, so the idea is essentially the following. Yeah? We can consider an ordinary integral, and uh, I can show you that uh, you can even bypass this analysis of analyticity that Mann and Senior and Ekman were doing, uh, because there is a way in which you can hope that you can rewrite your, uh, your, uh, your correlation function directly in a border summable way. So the only point, at uh, some point in quantum field theory that you had to do that you have to assume the existence of this function, as Slava was saying, <coughs> and this is relies on the existence also of the theory. So th this is something which is, will not be simple to, to, to prove. We have to rely on some other uh, results, like the one by Eichmann et al. So that is the following. If I have uh, a, an ordinary integral, so z of g, now this is uh, just an <coughs> integral, 1 over square root of g integral minus infinity plus infinity in dx. It's a very simple, e to the minus. I'm trying to mimic with this is uh, the mimicking uh, of, uh, of our path integral. Now with the ordinary integrals, f uh, has a uh, no good property, so this is, uh, this is convergent. So you see that, roughly speaking, you can do the following. I can, uh, so suppose <coughs> that there is uh, this f uh, as uh, one saddle point, which has uh, zero, zero action. Then you see that uh, you can take, uh, you can simply trivially change variables like this. Now, I will be very sketchy because I, d I don't have time to enter into the details here. So this, uh, this uh, integral essentially becomes an integral from minus 0 to infinity in the t of an integral. Uh, so let me exchange, uh, let me be cavalier in exchanging of the orders here. So you can rewrite this in the following way. Sorry. I mean, this is e to the minus t. And then an integral here in the x, delta f over g minus t. Okay, so simply nothing I have other than integral and then the delta function. Okay, now you can recognize that this looks like, so this is actually an identity, it's not really. So this is, uh, I can uh, somehow look at this as our gt. Bz. Yeah, yeah, there is, uh, uh, no, I mean, the way in which I written, it's actually an identity, if you, with a delta. If you substitute, there is a Jacobian, yes. X not over T, so, <coughs> but see it's an identity. Yeah, the integral in T of this will give me back uh, oh, okay. the original, right? Okay, so now, again, I, I don't have time to enter into the details. So the point is that you can look, if this makes sense, you can look at this as just the Borel function because the idea is that if this z is border summable, then uh, you should be, this should have this uh, parameterization here, and then uh, by matching, so to say, this should be some border function. Oh, sorry. So when you change the order of integration, you have to assume like convergence, or right? Yeah. So this is a convergent, well defined. There are some assumptions this f of x. Enough to change the integration. Yeah. You you just have to exchange the integration. Yes. Again, do, do, I, I mean I understand that there will be many things here, but I I. Have be, I'm a bit far away from uh, what uh, I should. Uh, y yes, you, you can probably do this, OK? And, and then uh, this is going to be the Borel function. And then you might ask, OK, let's see whether this has singularities. We, we say that the whole point in our, in our language whether w was whether this function, well, first of all, it exists. In this case, it's very simple to see that it exists. It's a triviality. And then whether it is a, a singularities on t plus or not. And from here, you see that the appar apparent possible singularities on t plus can only arise when uh, f prime uh, is equal to zero, because when you take the Jacobian, the delta of f will give you f prime on the denominator. So if you are going to encounter another saddle point, you will get uh, a problem. If not, uh, fine. So essentially, if your contour from minus infinity to plus infinity, you only cross, uh, say, zero, say x zero equal to zero, which is the only saddle point, and there are no others, then you will be guaranteed to be Borel summable. So this will be then uh, essentially you will identify this uh, as we did with the Borel summable function with the Borel transform 
function and we will be guaranteed that there will be no singularities on T plus. And then here you see that uh, since I simply manipulated my original, uh, my original uh, function, I don't need uh, to establish uh, using uh, uh, Watson criteria and so on, so mathematical criterion that tells me that ZB is equal to Z. Mm -hmm. Because the series I'm considering are series already with an integral, it's not a generic series, and then I manipulate to rewrite it in this form. So if this is you do, you do correctly, you automatically establish that ZG is equal to ZB of G. It's automatic. Okay? So this is, tell you, tell, is telling you that uh, whenever you, you take a saddle point approximation, you, you are careful enough that you don't cross more than one saddle point, then uh, you are guaranteed that you are borrowed summable to the exact result. Now, these things is actually true also for, uh, um, yeah, okay. So let, let, me, let me show you, because this is now important, a given example, the ordinary integral. So the simplest instance of a case like this is actually our phi to the 4 dimensionally reduced to zero dimension, which is, becomes this integral. Okay, if you wish, it's phi, to the, phi 0 to the 4, right? So this object here, you can show, it's, a very, it's the simplest instance of asymptotic series. So it's, uh, it, uh, when you expand the perturbation theory, it's asymptotic, but then you can resum, borrow resum, and you will get the exact result, which you can get automatically from Mathematica. In this case, you see that there are three saddles, one at the origin, and two which are complex conjugate on the imaginary act, which are purely imaginary, at plus or minus i. So there are other saddle points, they are complex, they, sh they shouldn't care. You don't need to deform your integral to pass over all possible saddle points. That's not correct. Okay? There, is a, there is a prescription to which saddle points you should consider. In this case, just the one at zero is enough. You shouldn't deform uh, your contour. Then there is another possibility, prototypical possibilities, which is the, the broken phase, if you wish, where you take uh, the mass times to be negative, So in this case, uh, the saddles are now all real. And now we are in troubles because our original integration crosses all of them. So my argument doesn't hold anymore. So I should deform the contour to make it regular. So here the situation now, I, don't, I cannot enter into how to do this. This is a little instance of picard lefsch theory. So you have to deform this. This integration, and at the end of the day, it turns out that while here this result is given by a single series, you reproduce the exact result by one per perturbative series around the origin. Here, you should consider you, sh you have to consider all three saddles. You have to deform the contour such that they will cross all three uh, points in a particular way. And then at the end, this result will be written as some uh, Z ZB0. So the Borer sum at, at 0 plus ZB1 plus ZB minus 1. Where now, with a proper choice of signs, which is uh, complicated, such that, I mean, I'm redefining this with all pluses. Okay? <coughs> so in the ordinary way, you will say that uh, this integral is not Borer summable, but instead uh, it's like uh, you know, a simple instance of resurgence. You have uh, not Borer summable, there will be an ambiguity that is cancelled by adding two other series. So it's a very simple instance of resurgence where, with ordinary integrals, this, is, uh, this trans series is very small. So you need a three asymptotic series. Okay? So now, the, 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 the point of this uh, geometric perspective that uh, I was uh, uh, here is. is uh, uh, it's very nice because it can, it can give you a perspective on how you, you could change the situation even for ordinary integrals to see that uh, there is a way in which I can, re, uh, I can uh, reproduce this result without invoking transeries, but just using per one single perturbation theory. So the point is uh, that the, uh, the saddle points are uh, always given by the function f, so whatever multiplied in the exponent which is weighted by g. This is the, the procedure. Here, if I would have had uh, some other function f0 of x uh, without a multiplication of g, still the set dot point will be given by f and not by this f0. f0 is a sort of a spectator. 
simply because uh, I should consider it's, it's a sort of a loop effect. It is not weighted by G, and the sandals are always given by F. So this is the key point here. To, uh, to this is the key observation uh, here. So given this, uh, you see that I can retake this uh, Z minus uh, situation, and I can deform in the following way. So I define a Z hat object, which is now a function of G and then an arbitrary variable G0, which is defined to be x squared over 2 plus x4 over 4 plus x squared over g0. Okay, so this is in general for generic g and g0, this is another quantity, so it's not uh, no longer uh, equal to my original one, but for the specific value, I don't find the eraser, g0 equal to g, oh thanks, for the specific value g0 equal to g is manifestly equal to my original variable. So you see that this is manifestly z hat g at g0 equal to g is equal to z minus. So what is here? The idea is very, very simple. So I look at this system at fixed g0. So g0 is, is supposed to be fixed now. At fixed g0, this term is, uh, is no longer uh, uh, three level, becomes quantum. And now here, despite my original problem was a, set, was a double well, I, I went back to the case of the single uh, you know, convex potential, because this is plus plus. So in other words, if I want to do a semi-classical expansion of this object, z hat, uh, the only set dots that will contribute, I'm guaranteed that this is going to be x equal to 0. It's the only set dot. And then now, uh, there will be, of course, a d different perturbative <coughs> expansion because now I have another term with respect to the other one. Clearly, this is another object. So, but this is the, cr the crucial point. You do perturbation theory around only x equal to 0. You resum it with the Borel summability is guaranteed. You do the computation, and then eventually you reproduce this exactly <coughs> this. OK? So you do this computation at generic G0, and then after you, you Borel resum, you get an expression which is valid for any G and G0. And then you set G0 is, is equal to G after Borel transforming. And after you do that, you reproduce this exactly Z minus with a single perturbative series. <coughs> no need of uh, trans series or nothing. Just by this the little deformation. OK? So, um, so this is uh, the key point, what, what we call uh, the exact perturbation theory, EPT. Exact perturbation theory means uh, that there are the situations in which you are guaranteed by these arguments that perturbation theory does not miss, uh, first of all, is well defined in the, in the Borel sense, and moreover, you, you are guaranteed not to miss any non-perturbative contribution. But then you have to do things not perturbatively in G0? Yeah, but G0, uh, G0 uh, uh, before doing you, at this level, you set g0 equal to g, and then at the end, uh, yeah, I mean, at the end, uh, clearly, the, the, the perturbative series here is more complicated, and uh, what were supposed to be non perturbative contribution uh, in the original, uh, in the original, say, uh, expansion here becomes a little change in the usual perturbative contributions. So there will be a different uh, large n behavior, they will have different co coefficients that you will encapsulate magically, all the non-perturbative contribution. So these things here is as actually... I mean, yeah, the ways to do this is it just, you know, for example, if you had some small term, not of this form, but just to push... The Very good, yeah. There are an infinite ways of, 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 of doing this. There is an entire family of a possible deformation that you can consider here. For instance, you, you, you can imagine doing... A, there are only some prescriptions, so you don't want to deform the, 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 the term that is... Uh, the one governing the asymptotic uh, convergence, you should, you should form the subleading term. But of course, there is a, a vast area of, uh, of you can play uh, as you wish, as long as you are guaranteed that the three level, what we call the three level, has only one center. So now this is, uh, yeah, indeed, this is uh, the subject of our uh, previous work. So with this way, you can, uh, you can show that uh, <coughs> you can uh, reproduce a result in quantum mechanics without instantons in, 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 in models where there are instantons. Okay. Is it, is it important for you, you chose x squared because then it's a Gaussian integral and we can always do Gaussian integrals, is that? Well, this is a x to the 4, no? I mean, exactly. 
here. Yeah, no, well, this is not necessary. There are situations, you, you could have expanded this around the minimum, then you would have an x cube, and then you play with the x cube. So you can play with what any term, and the only point is that you don't play with the, with the highest degree term. So you, I could have played with x cube. But once you do quantum field theory, you're not going to be able to do x cubed exactly, right? Whereas you will well, now, now you will see. Now, yet now you, if, if I will manage, to, I will, we will come to the, <laughs> to, to the, to the actual case. So um, the point is that there are a, a bit of possibly unfamiliar subject topics. So yeah. OK, so you see that this is, uh, well, this might look trivial in the ordinary integrals, because after all, we are able to do this uh, computation in, in all possible ways. But now you, you see that. Uh, this is all true also in quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, it becomes challenging because this, uh, this idea of, say, doing resurgence in quantum mechanics becomes complicated. You no longer have an, an inf a finite number of saddles. We have an infinite number of saddles. And for each infinite num each saddle, we have to compute the, the whole uh, quantum mechanical expansion ar around an instant. Point. And this is highly non trivial even in quantum mechanics, where loops are much, much easier than in quantum field theory. So this is a challenging task. In fact, has not been done uh, for simple system using this resurgence. So we, we are not able to do this uh, aside from very specific uh, systems that enjoy some properties. This is a, a complicated task because you have to do this infinite resummation. Here, with this trick, you, you reproduce this by sing a single perturbative series. So numerically, for instance, by doing at very large order in loops, you can do that at uh, in incredible accuracy. OK, but I don't have time, and uh, this is not uh, this, the, the main point of my talk. So the, ma my, the main point of my talk is that having this picture in mind is very useful, because uh, first of all, it, it gives, uh, if, you, if you wish, a more modern uh, uh, perspective on the original result by Ekman et al. So we, ex we understand this result using this trick that you can also extend in quantum field theory. Quantum field theory, as I said, you have now to assume the existence of this function, because this is highly non-trivial. So assuming that this function exists, we understand this Borel summability by the simple fact that the action S of phi of the phi to the fourth theory okay, does not have a non-trivial classical real solution for the coupling. So these are, are going to be our convention for this, uh, for this theory. Uh, these systems doesn't have uh, a non-trivial classical solution with finite action. The only uh, trivial solution being phi 0 equal to 0. Okay. So this guarantees, with our argument, that this Borel function exists. And at least you should have a Borel summability. The extension of this Borel summability should be the largest as possible. So G0, so as you know very well, th this theory has an interesting phase structures. When G0 is big enough, there is a phase transition. So what we can say is that uh, at least up to the phase transition point, G0 star, this uh, should be Borel summable to the exact result. If you wish, as another twist, uh, I mean, this was already Ekman et al. result, but with this other point of view, you can at least establish that uh, you should not, since this absence of solutions is true for any G, this should be at least true at, 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 at until this point. Now, at this point, the correlation function becomes singular then uh, you no longer know. So you can keep going, as Slava was saying. Here, wh once I construct the function, I can evaluate for any g. But then, uh, what am I evaluating? It's, uh, it's uh, something which is an open question, actually, for you. Uh, it's at the end of my talk. So I, I don't know what am I evalu evaluating, but I'm able to go keep going at any arbitrary g. But uh, mathematically speaking, I'm, I'm not sure I'm computing some, something physical. Okay. I, I will tell you, I, I will show you some plots of this. OK, so, uh, so what do I, I, I fear that I will not have time to discuss uh, properly the uh, previous approaches uh, to the phi to the 4. So I will just uh, sketch you this, and so we can uh, talk in private. So uh, the previous approaches to the phi to the 4 using perturbation theory were based on the following uh, uh, ideas. So one is epsilon expansion, which I guess uh, you, you know very well. I don't need to to tell you, nothing. Only the only point I want to tell you about epsilon expansion is that uh, the uh, Borel summability of the epsilon expansion is a conjecture. It's simply a conjecture because uh, it's uh, axiomatic uh, theorist. We, we don't have uh, a, an understanding of whether these theories exist in epsilon dimension. It's, there is only an analytic continuation involved. So axiomatic people were not able to to study 
for minus epsilon theories. So we really don't know what, which is the mathematical meaning of these theories. So uh, the, the nature of the epsilon expansion is conjectural Borel summable. So there are some empirical uh, reasons to believe that this should be Borel summable to the exact result, but nobody knows. Certainly, things seem to work. So if you do computation, you borrow some of the epsilon expansion, things uh, seem to work to a good accuracy. So this is what people has, do, has been doing. You do this many loops. But remember that you should always borrow some, <coughs> in particular to reach two dimensions, because epsilon is equal to two. So you really need uh, a significant uh, number of loops. And to do this, uh, argue with some numerical approximation, a Borel function which reproduces your perturbative approach. And then there is another one developed by Parisi, mainly by Parisi, Brezen, saint justin and Le Guillot, which uh, you see work at fixed d, so d equal to 2, or d equal to 3. Then you set up uh, a sort of a kalan semantic equation, in, and in the particular scaling limit, you can define a beta function, where now there is no clearly uh, sliding scale. We are in two dimensions, there are no logs, there is <coughs> nothing, so it's a different beta function, so to say. It's simply how the the coupling changes when you change the correlation length or the physical mass, and then you, you do you look for fixed point of this beta function, and once you find a fixed point, then you evaluate the critical exponents at the fixed point. So all these people, you know, had uh, a statistical uh, approach. So the main goal of all this community was to find the critical exponent at the phase <coughs> transition. And there are some results. The results are pretty poor in two dimensions because of various technical reasons. So this works uh, pretty well in three dimensions. So before the bootstrap, and, and was they were competitive, almost competitive with uh, uh, until a few years ago with Monte Carlo analysis, the epsilon expansion and this fixed dimension. Now, of course, uh, bootstrap took over. Uh, but the um, but in three dimensions works pretty well. In two dimensions, the the, the accuracy is very very poor. Okay. Uh, OK, so this is the, the old approach. Now, our approach is uh, slightly different. So our approach is more closer to the one of uh, Hamiltonian truncation. Uh, in fact, we were using uh, deliberately the notation a convention of uh, Slava Lorenzo uh, paper. So, um, so we take, uh, so you see this theory is the one of the simplest quantum field theory you can imagine. The coupling is super normalizable. There is only one divergence to the mass. The wave function is finite. Wave fun you don't need to renormalize the field. You don't need to renormalize the coupling. There is only mild mass uh, renormalization that you can get rid of with normal ordering. So it's uh, almost a finite theory. One of the simplest non-integrable theories. Okay. So in, 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 uh, what we do is it's very simple. It's again, in this spirit, we compute the, the, if you wish, call it the free energy of the, or, or the vacuum energy. So the vacuum energy lambda is a function of G0. Okay. And then we compute the mass, the physical mass, defined as usual with uh, in this way. So we work in the Euclidean. So here, this will be the, we will take an imaginary momentum here, but OK. The, so this physical mass. And then we will study the physical mass as a function of the bare parameters. And here we will take m0, just we'll set the scale in which m0 is equal to 1. The dimensionless parameter here is clearly g0 of m m0 squared. So this is the actual dimensionless parameter of when you do loopwise expansion. And then this is equal to g0 when you in this simple mm -hmm. trivial system. And then we look at the value we call the g0 star when uh, this is equal to 0, when the physical mass goes to 0. Okay? Well, I think these are pretty, pretty uh, obvious things. So I don't have time to show you. Uh, yeah, how many? We, we computed the many loops, so up to eight <laughs> loops. So this is a world record. Uh, and I want to acknowledge uh, our students that entirely on his own did this. So we were just watching his uh, progress on this uh, side of the loop computation. It was an amazing <laughs> task. I can tell you it's not only you know, sitting down. You, you need uh, quite uh, good skills to do this. Multiplici multiplicity is computation uh, of the integrals. It's a non-trivial task. And, and then with all these loops, what you can do, you, you find an approximate, it's it clearly now it, it becomes a bit dirty, numerical <laughs> recipe. You have to find a, a good approximate for your Borel function. This is done with, uh, there are various methods. The one we have been using is, one is called the conformal mapping. You map the complex plane into a disk. So this is reminiscent of the raw coordinates in conform, for conformal uh, people here. And, and another is simply Padet. You take the Padet approximate of the Borel function, 
and uh, and then you, and you do the, the computation. Okay, it's it's very very poor uh, uh, game. It's at some point, uh, unless you do computation up to in, uh, large order of loops, you have to do this. Uh, <coughs> you have to do this. Uh, you have to go through this numerical uh, steps. Now, if we can have, uh, yeah. Uh, I will show you now the results. <coughs> I'm sorry for being a bit late. So this is just an example of the diagrams that Gabriele computed, which is amazing. So the topology are so complicated. So uh, um, these are some vacuum energy graph. This is uh, some two-point function graphs and uh, one-point function. We have to study. Uh, we uh, now, unfortunately, because of lack of time, I couldn't uh, also appreciate. Uh, I t t told you that with our uh, with our perspective, we also have now, cl it's clear that even in the, in the broken phase, the phi to the four theory should be border summable. So this is a bit of an extension of Ekman et al. results, even in the broken phase. And uh, there, using our technique uh, with, this, uh, with this deformation, you should get uh, sensible results. Okay, so these are new territory. There was no results whatsoever in the literature. <coughs> All these uh, previous uh, approaches were studying the unbroken phase. So I will show you some results also in the broken phase. In the broken phase, there are also other complications, in particular, you have to follow the tadpoles and things like that. So that's why we have been computing also this uh, one-point function. Okay, so let me show you the, the result. First in the unbroken phase, which are uh, clearly and, uh, and uh, a bit more accurate. So this is just for fun. I show you what you do if you simply are dumb and you do perturbation, blind perturbation theory, you get a meaningless result, okay? This is up to a g to the eighth. And you see, clearly see that uh, with asymptotic series, it will be completely crazy to do perturbation theory, a strong coupling. Okay, so this, is g, this g is what I call it the G0. Okay, so uh, yeah, that, that doesn't make any sense. Okay. So this is uh, instead of the vacuum energy computed with Borel resummation using this conformal map mapping uh, method with uh, AS means asymptotic subtraction. So this is a yet another refinement, but don't. Let, 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 let's not worry about this. So these are the errors that we have. And again, the normalization here is the same also of Andrea's uh, last um, talk. So the critical uh, value, just to give a number, is around 2.7, 2.8. Okay, so this is the... What, what, what does the error bar mean? The error bar is the error because, we, of course, <laughs> there, is, uh, uh, there are errors uh, in this uh, when you do this numerical determination of the Borel function. So in fact, it's a pretty determining the error in these games is not trivial because it's also it's a error determination is not rigorous here. I should say that. So we try to be conservative because whenever you are not rigorous, you should be conservative. But you you you, you never know, right? So uh, this is our best uh, attempt to find a, a good error bar. It's a non-trivial issue here to find the error. So this is just to show you that optimal truncation wor works very well for reasonably good coupling. So since we have a sub up to g to the 8, you see that you can explore up to relatively strong coupling. With this normalization, 0.4 is not so longer a weak coupling. Okay? And you see that optimal truncation works very well up to almost g 0.5. Then, of course, uh, you go away because at that, at that value, you are only considering the one term because you shouldn't rely on all other loops, right? So you should clearly stop. But uh, it's, it's nice to see that uh, makes uh, some sense. So this is now the mass. So this is the mass as, ah, by the way, this is uh, something important. So this is uh, also related to uh, probably Slava uh, confusion at the beginning. So you see that, in fact, uh, in fact when I, whenever I compute the, 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 the vacuum energy, at least at this level of uh, accuracy, I don't see nothing occurring uh, beyond the phase transition. You see, I, I can keep going. This is infinite volume, of course. It's not finite volume. It's ordinary perturbation theory. Nothing seems at this level of accuracy Everything seems to be continuous. I pass through the phase transition analytically, and I go to some other whatever. That's it. Okay, so this is the result. Similarly for the mass. So if I compute the mass, just I resum the mass, not some other powers, just the mass. That's what you get. You get uh, start. You start from one, and then at some point there, which is uh, more or less the one. Uh, no, we see that with the good accuracy we have the phase transition. Then you go. Negative. At some point, you, this function uh, is analytic, doesn't care, just keep going. Okay. So that's what it is. But this is a very nice result. You see, there is a very good agreement, actually an excellent agreement with this, with the Hamiltonian truncation methods. Although, we, as you will see, the, our error bars are a bit more, uh, a bit larger. So here, also, just to be completely honest, I want to say that 
whenever you resum m, I resumed m because if you wish in back of my mind, I knew that the critical exponent in this theory is equal to 1, the critical exponent nu, okay, of the, of the icing. So, and this is why you resum m. If I didn't know that, uh, then uh, why m and not m squared, m cube, or even a fractional power, you wouldn't know what is the best <coughs> choice. Uh, okay, well, uh, th this is a zoom uh, of the, sorry, I should have said this uh, in a minute. So, so th this is the, our result, this is a zoom uh, close to the transition, and this is our best estimate for the transition. So it's, you see that our error bus is a bit larger, so it's, uh, it's compatible, I guess, with previous result. This is m. <coughs> this is m. I'm plotting m. And how do you know it's tiny? How do you know? Is the is the theory not a function of m squared? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I simply take the square root of the series and then I borrow some of the square root of the of m of the series in m squared. Wow. Of course, I took the when I'm, I know that at at one at at g equal to zero has to be one, so I took that branch. Yeah. I actually don't understand that comment about m squared versus m. So if you would do a three sum of squared and, and if everything worked nicely, you would expect to see a curve which touches zero. At exactly, but the errors are very, very big because you approach uh, through a zero and then there the errors are big. So the, face, the, the point of the phase transition will be, I uh, will have uh, much bigger errors. So this is the, uh, the best choice that, uh, yeah, either you try or because you know the critical exponent. So that's, uh, so. Yeah, well, one question about the, the, the errors again. So you are dominated by, by errors in the numerical calculation of higher loop integrals? No, yeah, the good point. So, so in terms of the Borel function. Yeah, the, the error is dominated by the sensitivity to, to, to irrelevant parameters. So when you do this Borel summation, a, 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 a good way to keep track of how good you are estimating the Borel function is to introduce <coughs> parameters for which the, your actual physical variable should not depend while the truncated, the truncated one w w would depend, like uh, some uh, scheme uh, dependence in, uh, ordinary in uh, ordinary perturbation theory. And this scheme dependence is actually the dominant error. Then we have also the convergence error, that we are at finite number of loops. And the last uh, error is the, the fact that our, uh, our computation of the highest loop is done numerically. And uh, this also has a little error, but th this is th the least of these three. So the dominant is the answer for the Borel function. Yes. So this cannot be reduced in the future. I mean, the, 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 uh, as, as you, as you mo keep going, increasing the number of loops, the sensitivity drastically decreases. So if you, if you are able to do a few loops more, things will be much better. So there is a, a strong sensitivity on the number of loops. So yeah, this is a zoom, so, and this is what I was telling you. Since, in principle, I do not know the, the critical exponent, I want to see how I could actually predict the critical exponent. So this you can, be, you can do by simply uh, looking at this log derivative of m, then you know that uh, the, uh, this, uh, the zero of this will give me, the, the, <coughs> the zero of this will give me the critical exponent straight away. And then in so doing, uh, this is now for various technical reasons, so this is, uh, works best with the PADE way, not with this conformal mapping. The two, by the way, are always in full agreement. So we, we have these two different uh, methods just to compare and to see whether things make sense. And you see that we have a slightly larger error, and then, but here we have a good, uh, a, 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 well, good, uh, reasonably good uh, um, <coughs> estimate for the critical exponent nu. Okay, so again, this is optimal truncation on the mass. So you see now on the mass, uh, things are not as good as the, the vacuum energy, but still optimal truncation somehow makes sense up to 0 0.3, but then, of course, then it doesn't make any sense. So this is now the broken phase. The, uh, this is the vacuum energy in the broken phase. Uh, in the broken phase, again, here I'm using the, the normalization for which the phase transition will be very, very soon, so at 0 0.25 around. And you see that I can keep going up to very large values and nothing changes. I mean, you have a, an analytic function, apparently. So this is uh, probably the most preliminary graph. I write very preliminary, which means that this is really preliminary. So the others uh, more or less uh, should be okay, but this is really can change in the future. Okay, so this is the, the, the value of the mass in the broken phase as a function of the coupling. So here, I mean, I will be happy to maybe to talk during the break with, with you. As you know, this mass uh, shouldn't at some point even exist as a single particle states because of the decaying kink and the kink that should happen uh, 
that should happen here, this is the normalization of these people, so this, uh, in this normalization, if I'm not wrong, should happen around 1.5 or so. And uh, apparently we don't see, uh, the error are big, but we don't see any, we don't understand here what's going on. So something should happen at those values of, of the capping, but uh, we don't have enough precision at this stage to see what's going on. But aside from that, this uh, uh, behavior here is in good uh, uh, agreement with this previous, uh, with this paper and also with some work by Lorenzo and Slava on the broken freeze. So now let me just end with the most, uh, yeah, the juicy part, which are, uh, I call it, curious facts. So uh, curious facts are the following. So you know that there is a chunk duality in this uh, system. So this is one of the main motivation for us to study this uh, qu quantum field theory, just to see if our ideas here made sense uh, in quantum field theory. And chunk duality provides some sort of a check. So this is the vacuum energy. The blue line is the vacuum energy in the unbroken phase which are now analytically continue up to even uh, values here. <laughs> so this is uh, beyond the phase transition point, you see. And then I overimposed here the vacuum energy computed in the broken phase. And in the broken phase, I actually compute two vacuum energies. Because in the broken phase, by chunk dualities, there are two branches. So there are two values of the coupling that gives rise to, that are dual to the same unbroken theory. OK, there are two values of the coupling. One is weakly coupled, when the other is strongly coupled. And uh, this is the green line here. And the one is the, sorry, this is the red line here. And the other is strongly coupled with a coupling that goes like the unbroken phase, which is this red line. Now, if this uh, analytic, this uh, uh, function here should have nothing to do with the actual physical observable, I do, I do not understand why these three overlap. So you see that the fact that these three overlap seems like to say that the, my vacuum energy computed in the unbroken phase analytically continued beyond G star still is capturing the actual vacuum energy in the broken phase. But these functions, they should agree at least at the physical coupling. And once they agree there, they will necessarily agree also in some region around this coupling. Yeah, that's a good point. This is in fact a possible, a possible explanation, if, if true which is in fact a possible explanation, would require a better precision to see whether this, uh, yeah, with this precision we have at the moment, uh, this is not enough to, to see whether. And also this is, uh, yeah, maybe this is uh, due to the easing duality, maybe this is also can be understood. So this is uh, the last, uh, I would say, curious fact, but now. So thi this, uh, this is now a bit of a, st a st different variable. So here, this is the coupling I, 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 I forgot to write. So this is the mass, okay, the mass of the single particle state as a function of the coupling. Now this is the coupling in the broken phase normalized as in this, uh, in this paper. So uh, in particular with the normalization of this paper, the phase transition occurs here. We are talking about the broken phase here. And these are the points which we stole uh, from this uh, paper, which are the Hamiltonian truncation results without, uh, without the error. I mean, we, we didn't steal the error, but the error, I think, uh, with the error bar will, be, will reach this point, okay? this particular one. And here there will also, be. so there will be some error bar in these points that unfortunately we, we, we didn't get at this stage. This black line is the kink mass, semi the semi-classical kink mass that for reasons that is not totally clear, seems to be in very good agreement even at value of the coupling, which it shouldn't because it's strongly <coughs> coupled here, right? So the still, uh, and here, this is the, the curious fact that this is the mass Analytic, this, the mass I showed you before in the, broke, in the broken phase, analytically, well, analytically continued, evaluated for values of the coupling which are beyond the transition, and then rescaled in terms of the broken variable. So you see that the two seems to give the correct result, and not only that, but uh, it seems that you get back, uh, you see, from here the transition, so this is in the dual coupling, so you should see this in, in reverse. So this is a stronger and stronger in terms of the unbroken phase, and you see the error, in fact, increases. But you see that the trend is that uh, this, this uh, mass function seems to reproduce, once you go beyond the G star, the kink mass. As I said, uh, I, I will conclude here, we don't have an understanding. change the size of that mass. Yeah, 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 it will change the size. So this is, if you wish, M squared or the modulus of M. Yeah, yeah, okay. We don't have an understanding of why is that, or if this is trivial because of some duality, or it's, uh, or it's wrong, or it's an accident. Uh, we, I just wanted to, 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 to finish by showing you this curious fact. So thank you very much.